Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I am reviewing Ellery Queen's The Chinese Orange Mystery, celebrating its 90th anniversary in 2024. This is often called the world's greatest locked room mystery, and I think it's definitely in contention. It's definitely like top 10. Is it number one? I don't know. I've never really thought about it before. It's certainly complicated and clever, to say the least. As a reminder, I will have a spoiler-free section up until the point before the murderer reveal, at which point I will warn you it's coming, and spoilers are fair game from that point forward. Before I begin, make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. The Chinese Orange Mystery opens up at the Chancellor Hotel. On the 22nd floor, a completely nondescript middle-aged man wants to speak with Donald Kirk, whom he has unspecified business with. The text uses the word unattractive, which I took to mean unnoteworthy, but I have seen it discussed as ugly, which I don't think is the correct interpretation. Mrs. Shane, the middle-aged clerk, shows him to Kirk's assistant, James Osborne, at 544. The man refuses to say what his business with Kirk is, but Osborne assumes it has something to do with stamps, since Kirk collects stamps, but it could be about any number of things. Osborne is very flirty with Miss Diversey, who is the nurse of Donald Kirk's elderly and cantankerous father. There is a lot of confusion about whether or not Donald Kirk is in, or if he's out, or if he is in, is he seeing visitors, or whatever, so Osborne puts the man alone in the anteroom, which is a very well-furnished waiting room with lots of books and food, including a bowl of fruit with tangerines, and we are told tangerines are also called Chinese oranges, which is a term I've only ever heard used in this book. Osborne does a lot of organizing for Kirk, especially with stamps, and he notices that a recently acquired Chinese stamp is missing a character. A few more people arrive to see Donald Kirk, including Irene Lewis and Joe Temple, who are both very attractive young women who hate each other, but they have to leave. And they don't wait for Donald, who does eventually show up with his good friend, and wouldn't you guess it, it's Ellery Queen. Osborne sort of forgets about that man in the anteroom, and it's been about an hour since he arrived. With Kirk, go, While Kirk goes to see him, the anteroom is locked. And this is very strange, because the anteroom only locks from the inside of the room, and there is no key. Ellery and Donald go to the anteroom's other entrance, and when you uh, they open the door, once you guess it, the unknown guest is dead, murdered with a blow to the head. But that's not even the weirdest part, and this is why this book is often called the greatest locked room mystery of all time. The entire room is a mess, despite not a sound coming from it. This is like Hercule Poirot's Christmas on steroids, but it's actually the opposite, because it was so quiet. And, and Hercule Poirot's Christmas, it's so loud, it was the, the key there. And it, the room was just a total disaster. And even stranger, the dead man has two large iron rods sticking out of his clothes. No one knows who this man is, as no one has ever seen him before. The hotel doctor says the man died after being hit on the head with a fireplace poker, which Ellery tentatively agrees with, but it's clear he's not like fully on board with that assessment just yet. Those iron rods are actually African spears that Kirk collects. The spears are somehow inserted through the bottom of each of the victim's pant legs and traveled up out from his waist. And it gets weirder because the victim's clothes are all on backwards. And not only are they on backwards, they are on backwards and buttoned. Notably, his necktie is missing. And not only that... Everything in the room is backwards and upside down. The bookcases are facing the wall. The paintings are facing the wall. Items on the table are upside down. It's very bizarre, to say the least. And when Inspector Queen and Sergeant Valley arrive, they just immediately roll their eyes and let Ellery deal with it because they know he's the only one who's going to be able to make anything of this. They focus their attention on the dead man, but he has no ID on him, and all the labels have been removed from his clothes. Ellery is interested in a tangerine. Miss Diversey, shortly before the victim arrived, had eaten a tangerine from the bowl and left two behind, but now there is only one tangerine and some pips and skin left over from the missing one, and Ellery is fascinated by this. He obsesses over this. Donald Kirk 
is extremely secretive about a lot of things. He invited Ellery to dinner to keep an eye on his business partner, Felix Byrne, but gives no concrete explanation. He refuses to reveal the contents of a note Glenn McGowan left with Osborne just minutes before the body was discovered. Glenn McGowan is Kirk's best friend, who is informally engaged to Donald's sister, Marcella. At this dinner, Ellery makes an ass of himself, as he's wont to do. Uh, there's a very good chance one of these guests is the murderer, because it's not possible for someone to have entered from outside the building, because the entrances to the anteroom were being observed, and they were on the 22nd floor, so no one could have climbed up. There's no balcony on the window either. No one wants to talk about the murder, and they all just seem to believe it has nothing to do with them, even though he was murdered in their office space, where everyone either lives or works there or was in the vicinity when the victim was murdered. You know, Ellery accidentally spills wine all over Donald Kirk, which he reveals the next day to his father was just a plot to steal that note from Donald. The note from McGowan warns Donald that he's getting involved with a rather dangerous fellow, but is vague as to whom. During the night, there have only been minor developments. The victim remains unidentified. Sergeant Velli found a witness who saw Donald Kirk in the Chancellor Hotel when the victim arrived, even though he claimed he was out for a walk at that time. Doc Prouty, that is the police doctor, performed the autopsy, and the victim's stomach contents did contain pieces of an orange, or a tangerine, as Ellery says. Doc Prouty doesn't care enough to make the distinction, and Ellery really goes all in on the Chinese angle. The tangerine is a Chinese orange. Kirk and Burns Company is called the Mandarin Press. Kirk collects Chinese stamps, and Joe Temple is a writer of Chinese literature. She's not Chinese herself, but was born and raised in China. Ellery is also obsessed with the backwardsness of the crime scene, and he thinks like once he figures that out, the whole case will sink into place. Though he does wonder if the backwardsness is meant to be a warning to someone, probably to Donald Kirk. Kirk and his business partner have an argument over Joe Temple. Byrne tells Joe that her book is terrible, and the Mandarin Press refuses to publish it. But Donald Kirk later reveals that he is madly in love with Joe Temple and can't publish her book because it's a conflict of interest, and he doesn't want to be responsible if it doesn't sell. But this is all interrupted by Dr. Kirk, who is loudly screaming, as all men tend to do. Someone stole his collection of Hebrew books. These books are not valuable, and notably, Dr. Kirk's Chinese books were not stolen, but Hebrew, like Chinese, is written and read in the opposite direction as English. Joe Temple tells Ellery all about Chinese customs and how a lot of them are the opposite of what they are in the United States. She doesn't care for American oranges because they aren't as good compared to Chinese oranges, which she doesn't consider to be tangerines. She doesn't think they're of Chinese oranges. And, you know, I give this book a lot of credit for a lot of things, and this is one of the nationality tiles where the cousins go all in on it. You know, this time being the Chinese theme, China and backwardsness is just everywhere, and it keeps piling up and up. Up, and the first half of this novel is just bizarre backward event after backward event, and it never seems like anything is clearing up or making sense. It just gets worse and worse. The next day, Glenn McGowan goes to the Queen residence, which I've always been amazed at how many suspects just go to their apartment. It's like the police inspector lives here. It's just very strange if you think about it. But anyway, he's concerned because a stamp seller contacted him about the Fu Chao stamp from China. This stamp is, as you might have guessed, very rare and printed backwards. It's of the harbor of Fu Chao, China, which is now called Fuzhou. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing this, but this stamp is a local stamp, which is a lot of collectors don't bother with. But what has McGowan so concerned is that this stamp is backwards, and the seller refused to divulge any information of how he acquired it. The seller is an Armenian man, and, you know, there are comments about that which aren't great, especially since this come right after Juna makes an appearance, which is also not great. But this Armenian man is always transparent and honest, and this time he isn't. It's too much of a coincidence for McGowan that a backward stamp just materialized in front of him under suspicious circumstances. Ellery confronts the seller, who very easily gives him to threats and reveals that Donald Kirk asked him to sell the stamp specifically to McGowan, who bought the stamp for $10,000. When confronted, Donald admits he did, but he didn't rip McGowan off because the stamp really is worth that much money. He did it because he's in bad financial shape and he's already borrowed or mooched enough money from McGowan that he resorted to this like underhanded method to spare him some humiliation and groveling. 
The Fu Chao stamp actually belonged to Zhou Temple. It was her father's. Her father was an American diplomat in China who was also a collector of objects he sort of lost interest in, and she sold everything when he died except for this stamp, which was the one item he actually cared for. Ellery is very interested in Joe Temple's father's collection and who she sold it to, which she said was like a small Eurasian man. On, on his way out, Ellery catches Marcello returning the stolen Hebrew books to her father's library. However, he doesn't confront her about it. Meanwhile, Inspector Queen and Sergeant Valley are getting nowhere fast with the dead body. No one recognizes the photographs. He didn't have to check in in a hotel anywhere. Inspector Queen begins to think this man must not have been a native New Yorker, or if he was even American at all. Not even the stamp collecting community recognizes him. This is more than halfway through the book, and there really hasn't been a lot of focus on the actual murder, which, if you watched my video on how to solve a murder mystery, you might recognize might mean something. Inspector Queen sends Valley out to try to track this man's luggage, because he might have left it somewhere. Ellery gets a telegram from Scotland Yard in London about Irene Lewis, who is not really Irene Lewis. She spells her name L-L-E-W-E-S, but her real name is Irene Sewell, which you might have noticed is Lewis spelled backwards. She's not really a criminal, but she's like criminal adjacent and loves jewels. And what do you know? They search her hotel room at the Chancellor, which is directly beneath Donald Kirk and Veli's, uh, which is directly beneath Donald Kirk's room, and Veli finds a collection of stolen gems, all of which belong to Donald Kirk. Osborne is shocked to hear this as he didn't realize the gems were stolen, and ironically, Irene is throwing a party to celebrate the engagement of Donald Kirk and Joe Temple, which the Queens crash. It was widely believed Kirk was going to marry Irene until Joe Temple came along, so this is all a bit awkward. It gets even more awkward because Ellery and his father accuse Irene of stealing the jewels from Donald, but she claims he gave them to her because they were once engaged. And this angers Joe Temple, who is present for this conversation. You know, Donald fumbles around with his answer when he's asked if he gave Irene those jewels. He said he did give them to her, but then he didn't, but then he did. You know, it's very awkward for him, and Ellery clearly knows he didn't give them to Irene, but just simply doesn't want to admit it. That night, Ellery commits a breaking and entering into Irene's apartment where he catches Donald Kirk doing the same thing. Ellery confronts him, but Donald refuses to say what he is looking for, but Ellery gets out of him that Irene was blackmailing him over something, and Ellery determines it must be about his sister, Marcella, because Donald wouldn't stand to be blackmailed over himself. He's just not that kind of person. Ellery soon after breaks into the apartment yet again and finds, you know, the documents and confronts Irene. What happened was Marcella had previously fallen in love with an older man from Paris and married him. However, that man was already married and he successfully got money out of Donald to go away because he reasoned correctly that Donald would rather cover this up than expose him. However, Marcella was also pregnant and had that baby in Europe where it is being raised by a nurse. Ellery actually says, quote unquote, unfortunately, the baby was healthy, which, you know, is really a line there. And Irene Sewell found out about this from the man himself. His name is Cullinan, and she got all the documents and letters from him, which Ellery has now taken. Ellery lets her go free, so as long as she promises not to blab about Marcella and give the jewels back to Donald, as well as the letters, which she agrees. Ellery then asks her if the dead man is Cullinan, and she isn't sure. The man she met in Paris had a beard, and it was a few years ago, so she's not really sure because this victim is older and clean-shaven. This all turns out for naught, however, because the French police confirm Cullinan is still alive in Paris. However, Sergeant Velli was able to get a line on the victim's luggage, which is in the check-in at the Chancellor Hotel. The clerk there conveniently forgot about that. Apparently someone else tried to get their hands on it, but the Queens do wind up with the luggage, and it contains mostly nothing of interest. A lot of clothes, including a coat with a label from Shanghai, which Ellery thinks is nothing but his father is all over, a copy of Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. You know, Pearl Buck is an American author who wrote a lot about the Chinese and Chinese Americans. You know, I've never read The Good Earth, which is her most famous novel, but you know, I do know a little bit about her, enough to understand the connection. You know, Joe Temple is heavily Pearl Buck coded, and in the future uh, Queen novel, The Door Between, the victim in that book is very clearly based on Pearl Buck, so the cousins were obviously a fan here. 
but there's nothing really interesting about this luggage that appears to be helpful at first. But Ellery starts going nuts about how everything fell into place, and he rambles on about you know the keys to open the luggage and all these other things that don't make any sense whatsoever. And this is where I end the spoiler-free section. This is one of those Ellery Queen novels with the challenge to the reader, the point in which the author lets you know you have all the information you need to solve the who, why, and how of the murder. And if you feel like you know absolutely nothing, you are not alone. These books are typically extremely clever and difficult to solve. It had been a while since I read this book, but I did remember the solution, and I was still very confused as to how one is supposed to have solved it at this point. But, so if you figured this out, you're an absolute genius. But anyway, spoilers are coming up, so beware, you've been warned. Ellery asks his father to find someone to build a realistic dummy of the victim so he can perform an experiment, but he's very secretive about this. You know, the cousins often withhold information from the reader after the challenge has been issued because they are of the belief you have all the information you need, so nothing else matters. Ellery gathers everyone in the ante room on the 22nd floor of the Chancellor Hotel for a patented sum summation gathering. He begins by explaining his thought process regarding the backwardsness of the room. He says he initially believed the backwardsness was meant to indicate a warning to a specific person, and this is what he operated under for most of the novel. However, Ellery rejects this idea because the message would have been incredibly vague, likely to be missed, and otherwise just ineffective. And how I wish the cousins followed their own logic here. Now, not so much in this novel, but in others, especially these earlier nationality titles, the cousins come up with some really bizarre cryptic clues. I kind of wonder if this was an inside joke regarding the previous novel, The Siamese Twin Mystery, which has like the king of cryptic clues. But anyway... Ellery says the room was intentionally turned upside down and backwards. The murderer took the time to do this, so they had to do it for a specific reason. Ellery then suggests if the intention was not to provide a message to a person, the only other logical explanation is that the murderer was trying to hide something that was already backwards. And since the identity of the victim remains unknown, there has to be something backwards about the victim the murderer was trying to conceal. And oh boy, the deductive reason you have to get through this one to figure this out is just really jacked up to super difficult and possible level. Ellery says the clue was the necktie. If you remember, the victim was not wearing a necktie when he was found, and it was assumed it had been removed. However, when the queens inspected the victim's, victim's luggage, there were no neckties in that bag, so the victim must never wear neckties. And what kind of man never wears a necktie and has something backwards about him? Well, a Catholic priest or an Episcopalian minister who typically wear their collars backwards. So by inverting everything in the anteroom, including the man's clothes, the murderer was hiding the fact that the victim was either a priest or a minister of some sort. Way back at the beginning of the novel, both Mrs. Shane and Osborne describe the man's voice as soft, which Ellery reasons is because he's a priest and used to speaking in that tone. This deduction is possible, I guess. None of the information is withheld, but I challenge anyone to actually get there based on the clues provided. As I'll explain later, this book actually is very easy to solve using meta clues and completely ignoring the clues provided, which will get you absolutely nowhere unless you're like Einstein or Newton or someone like that. The man is a the victim is a man of the cloth, but that doesn't really tell us much about how, why, or how he was killed. So Ellery continues, Using the items in the suitcase, Ellery realizes the victim lives in China and recently lived before that in the United States. And what kind of religious man lives in China? A missionary. So why did the victim come to the U.S. and see Donald Kirk? Well, strangers come to see Donald Kirk for three reasons. The publishing company, the stamp collection, or the gem collection. And since the victim was very secretive, Ellery ruled out the publishing company. And since he came from China and Kirk collects Chinese stamps, it stands to reason that the purpose the victim was there was to sell Donald Kirk a Chinese stamp. That much I think the reader could deduce on his or her own. However, no stamp was found on the victim, so it was obviously stolen. Ellery says that he had Veli search the murderer's living place and found the stamp. Kirk inspects the stamp, and it is an extremely valuable Chinese stamp worth about $50,000. That's about $1.2 million in today's money. 
Ellery then moves on to explaining how the murder happened, and this is extremely convoluted. I had to read these passages multiple times to fully grasp what was going on, so you probably did too, I guess. I'm going to leave out a lot of the details here and just give the gist of it. The murderer struck the victim dead, then placed a thin but strong wire around him and some of the furniture, specifically the bookcases, which we were told were slightly askew from where they should have been. Then, the murderer inserted the spears through the victim's pant legs so the victim would stand up straight because a dead body would be limp before rigor mortis sent in. Then, the murderer stood the man on a mat that was partially in the anteroom and partially in the office next door. Then, closing the door, the murderer pulled on the wire, which moved the bookcases and the body in such a way that it locked the anteroom door from the inside and dropped the body in the center of the room. The killer then removed the mat. This gave the impression that the murderer entered and left the anteroom via the unlocked door from the hallway, not from the office. Ellery demonstrates this in front of everyone with that dummy he had made, and of course, this all points to just one person, uh, James Osborne, the secretary. Only Osborne would have needed to lock the anteroom on the office side because that's the room he was in. He murdered the man a little after showing him into the anteroom, but not right away. He then stole the man's clerical vest, turn the clothes inside out and the furniture backwards, and then set up the contraction. The contraption. Why did he do this? Well, he fell in love with Miss Diversey, and she liked him, but he wasn't rich enough for her. So when this missionary from China wrote to Donald Kirk about a valuable stamp, Osborne planned to kill the man. As Kirk's secretary, all letters come through Osborne first. Osborne wrote back, pretending to be Donald Kirk, and eventually the victim, who is never named, left China to sell the stamp to Kirk so he could retire. In reality, Osborne planned to murder him, steal the stamp, and then sell it for money. When confronted, Osborne admits everything and commits suicide by jumping out the 22nd story window. You know, I don't think anybody could ever solve this using the clues in the book, even though it all makes sense. It's all there. Nothing is withheld from us, but it's just so complicated. It's never going to happen. Now, I absolutely think you could solve this using my meta clues. You know, the biggest one is when you have a complicated murder that's very complex and confusing, the solution is quite simple. You know, Osborne was the last person to see the victim alive. He was in the room next door, and he's in position to control the narrative. As Kirk's secretary, he sees all the correspondence coming in. The secretary is in a position to know everything and dictate the scene. You know, the cousins went out of their way to quote-unquote prove Osborne was innocent because of the locked door, and then when someone is proved innocent too obviously, you know, that's another clue. You know, I absolutely think this book can be solved, just not using any of the clues from the actual book the cousins want you to use. And just to wrap things up here, Ellery returns Marcella's letters to Donald. Why he doesn't give them to Marcella, I couldn't say, but Ellery tells Donald he should confide in Joe Temple what happened since she is going to be his wife, and then Ellery calls himself a misogynist who hates marriage, which is a sentiment very much present in these early novels. Mr. Versi is upset about Osborne, but in a shocking non-misogynist moment, Ellery does not blame her for the murder, saying the fault lies squarely with Osborne. In this era of Ellery Queen, one would fully expect Ellery to blame Miss Diversey for this, but he doesn't. Joe Temple teases Ellery about his obsession with those oranges, which provided absolutely no clue whatsoever. But then Ellery gets the last laugh here by saying, Joe is correct that the tangerines didn't mean anything, but the stamp the man came to sell, that stamp is called a Chinese orange. The end. Let's get into praise. I have this book at number five of 33 Ellery Queen novels. This is the highest ranked nationality title, and I'm confident in that position. I know I sort of mocked the complicated nature of this mystery, but this is a prime example of what I mean when I say I'm willing to sacrifice some credibility for the sake of a good puzzle. The plot mechanics here are outrageous and unlikely, but not impossible. I think that's an important distinction. Nothing in Osborne's plan relied on coincidence or luck or chance, except for like one minor thing. It didn't contain any elements that were scientifically inaccurate or pushing the boundaries of credibility. Now, would someone actually commit a murder in this way? No, of course not. But this plot is so intriguing, I'm constantly left baffled by it in a good way. And like I said, I've read this book before, I remembered the plot, and I was still struggling to figure out how I was supposed to solve it using the clues provided. But the clues are provided and it is a fair play if you use a lot of imagination and creative ingenuity. 
I think the cousins do an excellent job writing this book. First off, there's an improvement in terms of like the negative depictions of different nationalities and races and all that. There's still some of it in there, but it's a lot less than it had been in previous novels. And I think some parts of this book really could have been slow, but the cousins use humor to get through it. Inspector Queen is like a real pip in this one and how he doesn't even bother with like the backward stuff You know Ellery and Veli have their moments There's also like a lot of suspenseful scenes when Ellery and the police chase after the luggage bag And we have all of this to take into consideration just how influential this book is This book is a major inspiration for future locked room mysteries It's not the first by any means but it is the novel locked room mysteries are often compared to and try to outdo the characters are very good. You know, I think the cousins' characters are much better in future eras, but this is probably the best characters from the nationality titles, at least. So that's another plus there. Now, this book is not perfect, but the criticisms of it pale in comparison to its strengths. The biggest knock for me is the one coincidence that does pop up when, like, the hotel clerk just sort of forgot about the man's luggage. You know, that was convenient and produced artificial intrigue for a bit, and we don't get any, like, real explanation as to how it happened. Also, the man's name is nowhere in his luggage, which is also a bit strange. But I wish Osborne had a bigger role to play here you know he's the murderer and he was prominent in the beginning of the novel but then he sort of like faded away in the middle which was a shame I, I think we needed to know a little bit more about him and to be fair like his love for Miss Diversity and his lack of funds is mentioned so it doesn't come out of nowhere but it didn't feel like it was something that was like eating away at him and like pushing him to commit murder you know I have some really like silly little things like the stealing of the Hebrew books that just like didn't add anything uh, Early Queen novels are often filled with things like that as a distraction. I also wish there was a better description of the Chancellor Hotel. You know, I never really got the sense of, like, what it looked like or what the layout was, and that's sort of important. You know, I understand why the decision was made, because the cousins don't want the readers to be focusing too much on, like, the doors and the layout because then it might become apparent that Osborne is the only person who could have done it. But all these points are just minor and don't detract from the reading experience. And we also have some like not great stuff about like the Armenian stamp seller and Juna. Again, it is better than it's been in previous novels, but still not good. And most of my criticism here is just like my personal preferences and not any like actual flaw in the novel. You know, I wish maybe we spent more time like in the actual Chancellor Hotel investigating. And when you have like a locked room mystery, the mechanics are key. And it did seem like the cousins were a little afraid to go like too much into looking into the mechanics for fear of like exposing this plot. But quite frankly, I don't think that would have happened. I mean, this plot is so complicated. No one would get it, even if they just went a little deeper and quite frankly, a lot deeper. Let's move on to characters, and we'll start with Ellery Queen, who was very good here. I mean, the cousins really play up the lovable aspect of Ellery Queen's lovable jerk persona in this novel, where prior to this, he was, you know, a little more jerk than lovable. And, you know, it's all intentional character development on the cousins' part. You know, there are times where we're supposed to find Ellery annoying, but I really enjoyed Ellery in this book. I mean, he had his funny moments where he, like, ruins the dinner party with his intentional bad manners so he can steal the note, and he twice breaks into Irene Lewis's apartment to steal more papers, and he really makes a really funny comment to Donald Kirk about how horrified he is the publishing company is just so desperate for work that they might resort to publishing Ellery's books, you know, because Ellery writes mysteries, which still aren't a respected genre at this point. And Ellery, you know, definitely having no qualms about breaking the law here. And while he was always a bit reckless, you know, this novel really notches it up quite a bit in a very humorous way. You know, and I always give Ellery credit for being able to solve the murders like this one, you know. He lays it out in a very logical way you know despite the plot being so complicated and we have nice moments from Ellery as well I mean he's a lot less sexist here than normal you know he does have some comments about like you know how marriage isn't right for him because you know he's free and all that but I mean that's really more character than the sort of like accidental offensive content that's you know of its time but he really does show a lot of sympathy towards like Miss Diversity you know the Ellery of just a few books prior would absolutely have played Miss Diversity for Osborne committing the murder you know his opinion of women is improving a lot from earlier novels where he would say things like oh this crime was too genius so a woman never would have thought of it because women don't think much like like he doesn't say that here you know Ellery is a lovable jerk in this book with the emphasis here on lovable 
Inspector Queen also had a great presence. You know, I just loved how he took one look at the crime scene, just like shrugged his shoulders and passed it off onto Ellery. You know, the inspector always knows the best course of action and isn't like these other inspectors who are like stern and they want the credit. Like he just doesn't care and he just wants the crime solved. And his comments about like how irritating Ellery is during this case were really funny. You know, he always has good digs at his son. He's actually not at all helpful in this mystery. Like, at all he solves like almost nothing <laughs> because he can't get a handle on iding the victim but you know he's still a lot of fun i wouldn't say he's comic relief because the novel itself is pretty light but you know still a lot of fun still a, a good presence from him uh, we don't really see enough of sergeant veli or of juna for me to comment on them in this novel you know unfortunately for veli's case and fortunately for juna so i'll just skip them and go right into the murderer of james osborne who I thought left a lot to be desired. Now, all of his necessary character work is there. You know, it's not like he's, like, a terrible character, but my problem, like I said earlier, was that he's just absent for much of the middle portion of the book. And I suppose this is an intentional choice to divert attention elsewhere, as the cousins really seemed, like, very concerned about exposing things too early, even though this plot was not going to expose anything. But the reveal that he's the killer just, like... It's not unsatisfying, but it's really not as satisfying or dramatic as it could have been. Ellery quickly establishes Osborne is innocent because of the locked door on his side of the anteroom, but the, you know, the point isn't, like, driven home. So the impact of his reveal is blunted, and he's easily forgettable as well. I mean, I think he's, like, one of the more forgettable characters of this novel. Now, I don't think he's, like, a bad murderer. I mean, his motive makes sense. You know, his plan makes sense. He was able to pull it off you know, given his job and his position, just to remember, like, that's one of my meta clues that the murderer has to have control over the situation. But I don't understand why he just, like, didn't reverse the victim's collar. Like, I mean, because he turns the room backwards to disguise that. I mean, why didn't he just reverse the collar? I don't know. I guess he'd still be able to be identified as a priest, but I still don't see how that incriminate with Osborne anyway. And one last thing here is there's a very good clue in this book that goes unmentioned in the summation. But this murder required intense attention to detail and planning throughout the novel. You know, Osborne comes off as a bit of a scatterbrain. Like, he's always distracted by Miss Diversity, and he doesn't realize a lot of, like, Donald's collection is missing, and he doesn't know where anybody is at any time. And, you know, he's really playing up this part of sort of like the dodo head, and that he couldn't have done the murder because he's out of his, you know, capabilities. He couldn't have pulled it off. But very early on, before the murder, there is a very brief passage where Osborne discovers a missing character from a stamp, and it's a very, very small and insignificant uh, character missing, but he recognizes it instantly, and that's the clue that's supposed to tell you, oh yes, Osborne is attentive to detail. He could have done that, and he knows stamps, so he would have recognized the valuable stamp that he steals from the victim. It's so good, and it's so subtle, and it doesn't get mentioned at all, which is a bit disappointing, actually. And there's not really anything to say about our victim who is never given a name and don't even meet him alive. So moving on to the regular characters, I mean, Donald Kirk was a lot of fun. He's not unique in that, like, we see a lot of Ellery's personal friends throughout the series who have, like, these secrets where Ellery, find, where Ellery finds these guys, I, I really don't know. But, you know, I like Donald Kirk as a character. I, I felt his motivations allowed the intrigue and the mystery to continue and stretch in a legitimate way. It didn't feel forced or convenient. You know, I found him a fun character as a sort of, like, businessman who doesn't really do a lot of business he just like collects stamps and jewels for the most part and he has to deal with his father and his sister you know he's trying to manage all of these moving parts and fumbles most of them and he felt very relatable actually because he just keeps getting caught between a rock and a hard place and he's a viable suspect too i know there might be a tendency to exclude him from a potential suspect list because he's a friend of Ellery's which in this series is absolutely not a reason to exclude someone Ellery's friends have a very high rate of being the murderer actually but not the case here with Donald Kirk who again a lot of fun his father Dr. Kirk was like yeah he had a heavy presence but like didn't really contribute much to the story I mean I guess he was supposed to be this like comic figure of like the cantankerous old man but like he didn't really serve any real 
plot point whatsoever. I mean, his stink about the stolen Hebrew books is probably like the weakest part of the story. It serves like really no purpose. He was never really a suspect either. I mean, he does have some fun moments like yelling at Ellery for being an ass at the dinner party, but, and like making a mess. But again, not much going on here. I, I felt he could have been used better. And quite frankly, I, I think he could have been cut with ease. Although I guess he does need to be there for Miss Diversity to be there, but still, I mean, they could have found some other way to put her in. Marcella Kirk was a decent-ish character. I think she needed more development. Like, she was totally dependent on Donald and Glenn and, and never really stood out on her own. We never hear from her about her situation or her marriage or her child. And we're told repeatedly, like, how strong and independent she is. Yet, I mean, she's surrounded by all these male protectors who never let her defend herself or give her point of view. And, and again, this is largely because of the era of early Queen we're in, where, you know, there's a lot of chauvinism in these early books disguised as like chivalry, but she's also part of the Hebrew book red herring, which is like, I didn't care for. I mean, she stole the book. We don't even get her like a real reason. I mean, she said she stole the books because she knew the writing was backwards and thought that meant something. But then like, why did she put them back? It doesn't really fit in the story or even with her character, especially since she has other things going on. Like I didn't think it was necessary, but I think there's a good character in Marcella Kirk. It just wasn't brought out enough. I, I needed her to be more of a focus, more development with, with her let her speak but unless again still not like terrible and felix byrne was a bit of a hothead I and mean, he's the red herring you know suspect here we're supposed to be watching out for he has a bit of a temper and we never really get an answer as to why donald was suspicious of his business partner he's a valuable suspect for sure you know from the business angle but once you realize the victim was not present for the publishing company business you know byrne is largely out of contention he was a good character again another one i wish received a lot more to do again i think that's like i think these characters as a whole are very good but I, I do wish we they just were brought out more and used more in the story. But again, overall, pretty decent character here. Joe Temple is a very Pearl Buck inspired. I mean, she's a young woman who writes about China and her upbringing there. You know, I think Joe Temple is the character Marcella should have been. She's the strong, independent woman who doesn't need the man to protect her. You know, she provides a lot of information about China to Ellery and the reader. You know, in terms of being a suspect, it's a bit of a mixed bag you know this era of ellery queen really didn't use female murderers so when you use that perspective it is easy to write her off but uh, there's nothing in the text to do that and she remains pretty high on the suspect list you know just for her prominence and her connection with donald kirk she certainly outside of donald kirk probably the most prominent of these like one-time characters and she was very good character as well i did enjoy her and she was developed very nicely Irene Lewis, or Irene Sewell, is another great character. I mean, a very good blackmailer. You know, sometimes blackmailers in these novels are either just, like, so obviously, like, cartoonishly evil people, or, like, just, like, extremely hard to believe they're blackmailers. I mean, the book we're going to have next week is very much in that line but she was the perfect balance here I, I found her sufficiently evil for the task I, I liked her as a sort of like femme fatale figure who gets her comeuppance but isn't the murderer you know she would have made a good murderer but it wasn't to be and like even if the victim was the Cullinan man whom Marcella got her info from it didn't really make sense that she would kill him she was an excellent character she seems like someone who would would be a murderer but like I had to have a reason and it just really wasn't a reason for her to do it but you know she brought a lot of intrigue and humor and mystery to the novel i thought she was well done miss diversity was an interesting character as well and actually a lot of the female characters in this book were very good and in the context of where this book falls in the ellery queen universe especially you know i don't think she's like that interesting overall but her portrayal is i mean this character could so easily have just been like trashed and sexualized in very uncomfortable and sexist manners but it isn't and it shows a maturing in these books that previously had not been there and I mean, she's still a little sexualized, but it wasn't as degrading. And we're told repeatedly that like, oh, she's a nice person and she's a good caretaker. And she's another character I wish had a little bit more to do. But I love the ending for her where, you know, she's upset about what happened because she did love Osborne and she did make comments about money, but she loved him anyway. Like he didn't need to commit a murder for her. 
like he thought he did. But, you know, she also takes it in stride and supplied that, you know, she'll move on and she'll be happy with someone else and she's not going to be burdened by this guilt. And in terms of being a suspect, I think she's much more viable than the book treats her. You know, she's the only confirmed person to have been in the ante room before the murder. But it, it's never really given much attention outside the tangerines she ate. Again, I think there could have been more with her, but I did enjoy what we saw of her. And the final character to talk about is Glenn McGowan, who was who I thought the killer was the very first time I read this book. You know, he was in the vicinity at the time. He's active in Donald's affairs. Uh, there was a lot of talk about Glenn spending money to help Donald. That was all like leading up to him being the murderer. But it was a red herring and a very good red herring. Uh, that is one that can't be easily plucked out of the story. You know, with the note that he left Donald Kirk about always oh, dealing with someone dangerous. I mean, that so easily could have been interpreted, uh, misinterpreted as him dealing with like Irene Lewis as dangerous or whoever as dangerous. But it could also have meant him like as a warning, which... I thought was the case. I specifically remember the first time I read this book, but I guess there, I got tricked. Uh, there did seem to be a lot of animosity between Glenn and Donald, you know, despite them being best friends, probably over the money. And his motivation and the actions he takes are very similar to other murderers in previous Ellery Queen novels. So I did think he was a very good fake out again not necessarily like the most riveting character from like a personality standpoint, but he was used brilliantly. I liked him. And that is it for this video. I mean, there are some other minor characters I could talk about. Mrs. Shane, who I thought was very fun and humorous, but I guess she's barely in the book. So let me know in the comments what you think about the Chinese orange mystery. Is this the world's greatest locked room mystery? I think in terms of the actual murder mechanics, I think there's a very strong argument for it, but... You know, as a novel, I would still say Eric Poros Christmas is better. Uh, I just love that book so much. But, I mean, this is excellent. Don't get me wrong here. The Chinese Orange Mystery, very good. Next week is Halloween. So, of course, I'm going to review Halloween Party by Agatha Christie. Stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.